Hello, I'm going to do a basic presentation on Fermat's theorem. Now what Fermat's theorem says is that a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p for all primes p and all numbers a that are not a multiple of p. Now this is a very important theorem and we will discuss the proof and um, and the applications of this theorem along with a generalization of this theorem by Leonard Euler, a great mathematician, um, which generalizes this theorem to non-prime numbers using a function called the phi function. Now to understand this tutorial you're going to have to be familiar with basic modular arithmetic and uh, modular congruence is basically uh, by definition, what it means is a, if a is congruent to b mod m, then a and b have the same remainder upon division by m. Now another way of stating this, which in my opinion is more instructive, is that b minus a is a multiple of m. Now another thing you should be familiar with, so this is first thing and second thing is the basic properties of mods and arithmetic operations upon them. Now crucially you should be familiar with the division and that you know if a is congruent to b mod m then it follows that a d is congruent to b d mod m for some multiplicative factor d that's integer uh, but it doesn't go the other way around so this implies this right this implies this but this does not imply this, right? If you have AD congruent to BD mod M, what it actually implies is A congruent to B mod M divided by the greatest common divisor of M and D. Let me make a new canvas here. Let's see. Okay. Yes. So to prove the theorem, let's consider arithmetic mod P arithmetic mod p. Where p is a prime. Now, take powers of some number a, such that a is not a multiple of p. So we're going to consider powers of a number a. Um, and listing them out, we, we're going to have a sequence a2, a3, and so on, mod p. And the important thing to realize about the sequence is that it must repeat. And why is this the case? Well, consider the set of um, modular residues of p. Clearly, anything mod p must be congruent to 0, 1, or up to p minus 1 mod p. This is the residues mod p. And Basically, what this means is the only possible remainders you can have upon dividing by p is the set of numbers from 0 to p minus 1. And this is true for any number, obviously. And we learned this in elementary school. Um, not, even, and not necessarily a prime number, of course. But the, the primality of p will be important um, it, a little further down the road. But keep this in mind. And since this is the case, we know that some two of them must repeat of this sequence. Because if you have p plus 1 numbers, right, because this, this is a collection of p numbers, and let's say we go out to the a to the p plus 1th number, then there must be some repetition, because we cannot fill p numbers in, in this p plus 1 slots without repeating another one. And this should be... Uh, in, intuitively clear. Now, um, so we claim that the sequence repeats. So call the the particular elements of the sequence a to the r and a to the s. And if this repeats, we have that a to the r is congruent to a to the s mod p. And what follows is a to the r minus s is congruent to 1 mod p. Why is this? Well, since a is not congruent to 0 mod p, 
the greatest common divisor of a to the s and p is 1. So we can divide the congruence and still keep the same mod. And that's the beauty of using a prime number. And, and in, in number theory, prime numbers are basically the, the fundamental building block of all other numbers, which is what makes this particular proof interesting. And it begs the question, how can we generalize this to, to other, other, other numbers that are not prime? So we, we, we have this fact that a to the r minus s is congruent to 1 mod p. Now, this, this is not from Oz's theorem yet, but we are very close. So I'm going to make a new canvas, and I'll show you how to get from here to Fermat's theorem. Now, consider the set of numbers 1, 2, to p minus 1. Consider this set. Call it S. Now, if we multiply all these numbers by a, um, then we get a to a all the way to p minus 1 times a. Now, notice that none of these new numbers, which can be written as k times a uh, for some k in s, none of these new numbers are divisible by p. And all of them must be in the set 1, 2, all the way up to p minus 1, since we are, con we, we are, we are doing arithmetic mod p still. When, when, taking, when taking mod p, all of these elements must be in this set. Now, the third, the third point is that you know, no two of these elements are congruent, right? Uh, that, that means no, no, no two of, of these elements in this set are congruent. And specifically, uh, if, if th that were the case, right, if, if Ka was congruent to Ja mod p, then we would have K congruent to J mod p. But this is not the case, because A is relatively prime to p, so we can divide by A, as discussed earlier, but this cannot be the case, because all the numbers here are distinct. So upon dividing by, by a, we generate this set. So it follows, follows that follows that this set is just a permutation, a rearrangement, some rearrangement of this set, mod p which is a great result for the following reason. Now, what, what this means is, since this is just a rearrangement of this set, clearly the product mod p would be the same. And uh, specifically, specifically, the product a times 2a times 3a all the way to p minus 1a is going to be equal to the product of 1 times 2 times p minus 1 mod p. But we just we just argued that that you can divide by a because of the relatively primeness, the relative primality of a and p. So it follows, canceling all common factors, canceling dividing by uh, p minus 1 factorial. Oh, sorry. Is that right? Yes, sorry dividing by p minus 1 factorial, which can be done. Not, sorry, I made a, a bit of a mistake there, misspoke. Not because a is relatively prime to p, but because the set of numbers 1, 2, all the way to p minus 1 is relatively prime for all s in this set. The GCD of s and p is 1, or another way of saying that is s is relatively prime to p. Now since this is the case, we can cancel. We can divide by all these factors. And in effect, we have p minus 1 a's. And we have p minus 1 uh, factorial here, which we just divided by. So we, we have 1 on this side. So our conclusion is the great statement 
that a to the p minus 1, actually I'll use a different color, since this is sort of the final, the final result, a to the p minus 1 is congruent to p, oh, I'm sorry, to congruent to 1 modulo p. Now this is true, to reiterate, for p prime and all a such that a is not a multiple of p. Now, let's cover some important commonly occurring types of problems on, in, in contest math. Now, one example is a problem where you're asked to just calculate the remainder of something like this when divided by some prime, say 17. By our theorem, we have that 4 to the 16, p minus 1, is congruent to 1 mod 17, which implies that 4 to the 16 to the 4, sorry, 16 to the 5th times 4 to the 3rd, which is, uh, sorry, 4 to the 7th. Let me, let me reiterate that to, <laughs> to, to make that statement clear. 4 to the 87th can be written as 4 to the 16th to the power of 5 times 4 to the 7th. Now, this is 1, and 1 to the 5th is 1, mod 17, and this is, uh, this is mod 17, right? So, 4 to the 7th, now 4 to the 7th is actually easy to calculate, because we can just uh, break, break this down into, into powers of 4 that can be verified computationally. So, specifically, 4 to the 7th is congruent to 4 times 4 squared cubed, which is congruent to 4 times 16 cubed. 16 cubed. And 16 is minus 1 mod 17. So this is congruent to minus 4, or 13 mod 17, which shows that the remainder of this thing, when divided by 17, is 13. What a great result. Now, suppose, actually, let's, let's wait on this for the next video. I know I mentioned that we would um, discuss the generalization of Fermat's theorem to um, relatively prime, or sorry, non-prime modular um, mods, but I don't think that it would lead to a very appetizing video as the length is now approaching 15 minutes. So I will separate that topic to the next video.